subsequently against Froggen, and he's not allowed to commit to it. He's not allowed to play it at all. And it's quite interesting because we don't associate those assassin players with Froggen. Well, LeBlanc has been banned out as well. We already saw Ambition this morning in the OGN Masters going crazy on LeBlanc, so we know how well that can be played. Pantheon also being taken away from Yankos this time around for Alliance. Now, we do see in terms of the first picks here, Rocket locked in that Kale. We talked about how important it was for both of these mid laners. Froggen's played it twice. I believe Overpass played it several times more. And what it has meant, though, is that all these priority champions are just being afforded to Alliance. Yeah, and you can see that straight away. Elise was picked up by Shook was 174 on it last week. Not the greatest performance, but his team do put a lot of stock in what he did for his team. He may have died seven times, and that was about 70% of the entire team's deaths. However, all of the kills that he set up for Froggen was a big part. Yeah, I distinctly remember we were actually talking to Froggen and uh, Shook after the show mm. last week, and I called him out and said, right, why did you die so many times? And Froggen jumped up he and jumped said, on us. are you kidding? He said, every time Shook died, I got to kill and Kale. Before 15 minutes, I believe Froggen was about 3-1-0. And every time uh, Shook was caught, he was in the right place for his team to capitalize. Whether or not that was coordination or a little bit of luck will determine, you know, will be seen. And we'll see how Sh Froggen decides to play this game, seeing as that Shook's got that sort of very aggressive, very invade-heavy type jungler. Well, Tams also went for Lucian over Caitlyn. Caitlyn's a champion we'd associate with him all that season. This time around, it's going to be Celeber on Caitlyn. And we do see Trundle for the top lane. So Zaz is going to go with that sort of tanky top that we're still seeing in the current meta. We're seeing a lot more Trundle these days, and it does fairly well against a lot of matchups. I quite like that locking, considering Wicked's champion pool. If Wicked decides to go for the likes of a Renekton or the likes of a Malphite, Trundle's going to suffer a little bit early against Renekton, which is what I'm expecting, but we know he'll have a bigger impact in the mid to late game. So Rocket right now just screams late game. They want to scale, and they want to beat Alliance in the late. Well. Froggen trying to gauge a reaction from the crowd. It was an obvious one with Anivia, but it will be Renekton in that top lane, as you mentioned, for Wicked. Leona will be the support also alongside Lucian. So I want to see the support now for Vanda. This is my question. You've already highlighted the fact that Leona's locked in on the side of Nif. Annie's banned out. Thresh is banned out. Vanda has played Morgana once before, but he played that into a Vi. He played that into a, champ, uh, uh, into a composition where it was very single target CC heavy focus. And that is somewhat similar. You can protect against the Cocoon, you can protect against that sort of Zenith Blade root from Leona, but it's a little bit more risky, even though Alliance have got a good all in. We'll see how, uh, if Vanda's gonna go with this. Alternatively, he's played Lulu. I think those are the other two champions he has played this split. Clearly having a think about this one, taking their time to lock it in, leasing the other jungler being thought about by Yankos. At the moment though, I mean, Morgana would work out well because, you know, you think of Renekton, you think of Leone, you think of even Elise. All of these champions have got to get in amongst the pack, and that would be a great deterrent. And that Morgana is going to scale incredibly well. If Even if, you know, Vanda goes for those standard support items that is locked in now, he can eventually start working towards some either tanky items to be the sort of tank that can initiate and potentially root, or if he goes for some ability power, a dark binding plus the Kale damage and the range of Caitlyn, that's going to be a dead member of Alliance. If Froggen's going to play safe, I'm almost expecting him to go uh, Oriana. Alternatively, Gragas is available. Ziggs is available. You've got heavy wave clear, heavy wave control, which is good for sieging and for counter sieging, which I feel would be very vital for here, for Alliance. Outside of a little bit of poke here from Lucia, there's not much wave clear on Alliance, so I feel they have to go Ziggs or Gragas. Oh, well, we do wait for Alliance to decide that final champion choice. Let's go back to our featured matchup setting, which was Shuk versus Yankos. And at the moment, it's two very aggressive junglers, Lee Sin versus Elise. And they're going to be looking to do the similar. Whoa, 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 that's... Okay, okay. Let's let's stop that trail of thought for a moment here, because Froggen, going back to basics, pulls out Anivia, a champion he was so famous for throughout Season 2. Now, we'll have to see how it works in the 2014 season. Two years down the line, Froggen tried to play Anivia last year to, to poor success. I mean, he it, it didn't rack up very many wins. We've got the running joke that Krepos has the, a better win percentage on Anivia than Froggen does. We talked about the fact that Alliance needed wave clear and they needed the potential to defend against sieges. Anivia is going to be great for that. The crystallized wall, as well as her, her ultimate just to do a zone control, will help Alliance defend turrets. But the Kale versus Anivia is a very interesting matchup. It's one we have never seen in the season. Oh, fantastic picks. We'll see how it works out. Who would you favor just going off the picks and bans here? 
I feel like the early to mid game is in favor of Alliance. Their, their champions, the Renekton and the Lucian, uh, even the Elise is going to sort of scale a little bit sooner than that of the Rocket composition. However, the longer this goes, the more I prefer Rocket. Well, with the champions locked in, let's turn to the numbers. According to lollysports.com, 73% of you have chosen Rocket for the win here. Interesting stuff. And of course, we'd like to remind you guys that you can get tickets to join us here in Cologne, Germany and watch these games live like all the fans are right now. Just head over to lolesports.com and click on tickets for all the details. I think that's a fair vote as well. Mm. Considering Alliance's up and down performances and seeing how they uh, ne haven't necessarily kept it together two weeks in a row is a testament to the fact that the, as a team they're still growing, they're still learning, they're still trying to adapt and we keep hearing them from that over and over. So as we blend into the game, let's just remind you guys, last time these did face off on the rift, it was Rocket that took a victory. And it was pretty convincing. It was pretty convincing. They really controlled the mid game heavily. I, I have to point this out for those of you that haven't seen it yet. Overpow is running is that cleanse? Yes, cleanse, flash cleanse as his summoner spells. Initially I thought it was revive, it is the new artwork. And I think that's because of the immense CC. Single target Renekton, single target Elise, single target stun there from Anivia. And that's going to allow him just to continue focusing down and putting damage out once these hard CCs start coming in. Well, if you are just tuning in, well, you've missed some fantastic games already today. This is game three of the day in week five of the European LCS. Rockout, of course versus Alliance, as you can see at the top of your screen. Some interesting picks coming into this one, and we wanted to start talking about these junglers. We brought them up as our feature matchup. The fact that Jankos is back on Lee Sin, Shook back on Elise. Yeah, it's, it's champions that we, we associate with each of the individual players. I think there needs to be a little bit more pressure on Shook in this game. Elise was Shook's sort of main champion in solo queue coming into the LCS split. It has been banned or stolen away from him multiple games. I mean, I think around 45 to 50% of all bans against Alliance have been jungle bans. Last week he made it work, and we'll see if he can do it this week. Well, we are just waiting for one of the players to uh, restart their client. It looks like it is on the Alliance side. Looks like it's shook in that jungle, so shouldn't be affecting him too much as he just reconnects into the game. Of course, we are offline here in the uh, LCS studios. They are on a tournament realm server, all of their own, so they have full control of everything that would happen here, which is why they're sorting this out so quickly. One of the things I really want to talk about is that Froggins and Nivea is going to be very, very powerful in these team fights. When you consider the rest of the champions on Rockat squad, Trundle, Lee Sin, Overpow, oh, Tabs is not interested <laughs> in this small pause. Um, you know, when you consider Rockat's composition, they want to be running at you, they want to be involved, they want to be in your face. Vander and Morgana, for example, when he throws down those soul shackles, he wants to be in range of the Alliance members. And if Froggen is able to put a good wall down, a good crystallize, that Morgana ultimate is going to be completely neutralized. It's no longer a big threat. The key for Alliance, however, is to make use of that and then re-engage. And we'll see if they can pull it off. We'll see whether uh, Tabs can wake himself up for this game as well, because right now he's very relaxed and ready to play Rocket. Rocket themselves, well, they're going to be up against, like you say, that big frozen wall. It's something we've seen for many years in League of Legends from Froggen, it's a champion that can stall games out. And this is maybe what Alliance are going to be looking at. I mean, you talked about how the, the mid to early game team is all for Rocket. Uh, yeah, I, other way, I think other mid, way mid to early for, for Alliance, just in terms of, you know, Renekton, the Lucian, even the Leona, the engagers, once she's got a solar flare, are so powerful. But I, I really don't know about this in Nivea. Yes, you can see, you can stall. Can you stall more effectively than Ziggs or Gragas? I'm not sure, and it remains to be seen. We're about to see whether or not it actually works, as we are back on the rift. Well, we're just waiting to get things on the way. No action early on. It doesn't seem that anyone's going to go aggressive. Of course, we did see a couple of aggressions early on, but in previous games at the moment, they are certainly taking their time. So. Let's go through these lane matchups. It doesn't seem that we're going to have any lane changes. We just saw that in the previous matchup, of course. SK came in trying to pull a fast one. It didn't quite work out for them. They were reacted to, but it doesn't look like even teams will want to do this. So I think in terms of the lane matchups, the obvious ones is that Trundle is going to have a difficult time against Renekton. This is something we've talked about ex uh, excessively. Renekton is a lane bully. He's going to be able to beat Trundle until Trundle gets levels and items. In the mid lane, Overpower versus Frog, and I think until they get six, is going to be a bit of a farm fest. This bottom lane, however, 
that's the, the threat for Alliance. Because of the range of Vanda and Salivas, Caitlyn and Morgana, it means Tabs and Niff are always going to be in the, on the defensive foot, always going to be waiting for Rocket to push them. And until Niff gets level 3, level 4, or even level 6, they can't really all in with the actual threat of getting kills. Yeah, I mean, obviously, last time we saw Vanda playing Morgana, it worked out very successfully, and they just keep catching those dark binders on Tabs, followed by the Piltover Peacemaker with Salivar. It's a great combo. Yeah, it's working out very well for them. And Vanda, two for two on those dark bindings, he's gonna be able to keep forcing Alliance backwards, keep focusing Tabs down. Tabs has already used his potion in that lane, so he's going to be under even more threat of being caught out. Luckily, though, the wave is pushing against him, and they should be able to defend under the tower just a little bit safer. It'd be interesting to check out Froggen's runes, because I do recall last time around he played in Nivea, he actually went attack damage runes at the start, just to make sure he could get those basic attacks, obviously, because that is the weakness, I guess you could say, of Anivia in the early six levels. Yeah, at this point in time, it doesn't look like it. He's still got the base 58 AD, so not going for anything along those lines. Um, Froggen builds Anivia uniquely to the game <laughs> setup. We've seen him actually build Warmog's armors, you know, in yes. games like this. Used so his first item. Correct. We've, we have seen that in the past. I'm very interested to see where this uh, uh, Fairy Charm does actually go, whether he's going to work himself towards a Chalice or maybe get a tier. Anivia is one of those champions that really needs items and levels also to scale up because of how dependent she is on her mana pool. Look at the pressure in this bottom lane. Double the CS almost already by Sullivan. Really putting pressure on this bottom lane. Yeah, and uh, it's going to continue this way until Nif hits level 6, until Nif gets uh, the ability to all in and actually get kills, or Shook comes to gank. Sullivan and Vanda will continue to focus down this wave, shoving it up as much as they can. They know that uh, Shook is going to be around level 3, level 4, and we haven't seen him show himself for a gank yet, so Sullivan and Vanda do have to be a little bit careful because there is, there is the threat of being caught up by that Zenith Blade plus Cocoon plus damage from Tabs' Lucian. And let's, let's talk about the coin, because Vanda's starting off a little bit different here from the, the standard. We're obviously so used to seeing the Doran's Blade starts these days in Europe that we generally just suddenly, suddenly realize, oh, wait, he's gone for the coin. Yeah, it's such a safe lane for Vanda. He's not at threat of being poked down. He outranges Leona, Caitlyn outranges Lucian, and because they know that they're going to keep uh, Tabs and Nif down, He's just going to start that GP10 earlier, st uh, start building himself up towards a stronger mid game. And I think it's very smart itemization. We've heard how uh, in the past, you know, in actual fact, it was the, the, the Rocket guy saying how they could afford to go for the Relic Shield as an opening item because they weren't a threat. They didn't need the stats of that as Dorans. Well, both junglers have returned to base. They're coming back out. They're both picking up that Spirit Stone. Spirit Stone? Spirit Spone? I don't know. I think it's a new item I just made up. They also went for the boots, of course, and a ward. So we'll see whether they go aggressive. These are two aggressive champions. They're already up to level four. No early ganks from either of them yet. They, they missed that sort of double buff gank window. And I think it's uh, a testament to the tension right now. With the exception of this Tabs, this Nifle, they have caught Selva. I think that was Nif just trying to actually get the minions down low enough and suddenly piled onto Sullivan. I'm not sure whether he intentionally went for that one. It was just a case of, I'm going to get the minions down. Oh, I've caught this one. Something that's very important to note is how quickly Vanda got that black shield down. If Vanda is able to get that on Sullivan very quickly, he can actually avoid the shield of Daybreak stun. And that will be very important for Sullivan to either back away, get out cleanly, and also continue replying with damage. Well, Yankos is the first to try and visit one of the lanes, and it seems they're going to try and three-stack it here. They did just capture Piltover and Dark Binding onto Nif, and they realized, obviously, the AD carry had backed away Tabs because he's got that Vampire Acceptor. So they're going to try and push this lane as quick as possible, but you see Tabs, and he's reacted fast enough. Yeah, whenever you've got an AD carry like Caitlyn on your team, and you've got that very big range disparity against your opponents, you can afford to try and force this tower down. Remember, the, low, the bottom lane towers are weaker than the other lanes, so it gives you an advantage if you can get it. Didn't work out on this wave, but that tower is incredibly low. So if Salavan and Vanda keep that focused attention up, the tower will drop soon. Well, Yankos has done enough. Meanwhile, in the mid lane, we see the level six being reached by both Overpower and a Frog and Frog and himself. He start clearing those waves, but you see Overpower. We've seen him on Kale before. Everybody knows what he can do on this champion. We saw it it's Ninjas and Pajamas, who will be playing tomorrow, by the way, right here in Cologne, Germany. They have certainly seen firsthand what Overpower can do on this Kale, and it's not a pretty sight if he gets going. Yeah, not a pretty sight for everyone else. For Overpower Rocket, it's a beautiful sight. Yes. And I think just highlighting Froggen right now, hit level 6, hasn't put any points into Crystallize. And I think both the champions of Kale and Anivia need to hit item thresholds before they can 
really insta-gear people. If Froggen's able to get a good sort of Flash Frost plus the Glacial Storm, you know, get that sort of double damage down, he can kill Squishies, but it's going to be very dependent on landing those stuns from his Flash Frost. And of course, you know, with Shook on Elise, he would love to have that blue buff himself, but of course, we'll gift it across to Froggen. It is going to be similar, but Yankos, well, he's not too worried about the blue buff, that's for sure. Doesn't really need it for the cooldowns too much. Doesn't need it yet. Yes. And the reason I say that, as a team, Rocket love to invade and challenge for blue buffs. They love to fight your opponent's blue buff and uh, pick fights around that area, get vision control and challenge for it. And against a, a mid lane champion like Anivia, there's going to be added emphasis for Rocket to gain control of that area of the map. Not only will it help them with Dragon, but it'll help them prevent Froggen getting more powerful early on. We should also mention this is 4.1 still, by the way, for ladies and gentlemen. 4.1. So Kale still very strong in this champion. Still very strong in 4.2, let's be fair, but not the ability power 1. 0.0 Q that uh, Deficio has loved to mention, and probably the reason he's gone there. Yeah, his fault indeed for <laughs> everyone out there that's uh, wondering why it happened. We do see a quick trade between Zazus and Wicked, and as we've talked about, Trundle losing to Renekton early on. It's only about an 11 CS uh, difference right now, which isn't the strongest. What Wicked needs to do is get himself either a kill or get a lot of damage on that tower to really, really uh, make that CS lead count. If it's only a minute CS lead by the 15-20 minute mark when the team fights start happening and Zaza starts teleporting around the map, it's going to be irrelevant that you had that early, that strong early game and you didn't take advantage of it. Well, speaking of the top laners, let's touch on the fact that obviously Zaza has got the teleport. This is something he's run a number of times, has just teleported back towards the top side. It's going to actually be going to be a cooldown for quite a while, so don't expect any Dragon Sight anytime soon. Wicked didn't go for that, so what, what are we thinking here? I mean, because Zazus, we've seen him split pushing like a hero so many times for Rock out already in the LCS. Is Wicked just going to have to sit and fight in the whole way, or is he going to be on a maneuver, maneuver well, they, for his team? They've got slightly different roles, I feel. You know, when you pick a Trundle into a game, it's to be somewhat of a tank killer, you know, steal those stats away, as well as be a high utility damage soaking force in team fights. Throw those pillars down, get your frozen domain, really run circles around your enemies. When you play Renekton, on the other hand, you tend to be a little bit more kill-centric. You can see that the Tiamat has already been picked up with the Ignite as well. If Wicked can get to Saliva, get to the back line and kill him, he's done his job. Zazus, on the other hand, he's going to fulfill a different purpose. He has to interrupt the Lions, make their lives difficult, and get in the way of Alliance's abilities. You can see already Wicked just testing the waters there with that Tiamat on Zazus. I was realizing he picked it up and suddenly steps away a little bit. And that chain vest, he should be perfectly fine in that matchup so far. We haven't seen a great deal of action across any of the lanes so far, despite the fact, like we mentioned, two very aggressive junglers. They haven't gone for the kills. They haven't gone to the top. They did once to make an appearance down the bottom, but that is about it. Both teams happy to farm it out. I think they're both playing for the late game, and, and this is, in my opinion, favoring Rocket. I, I feel like Rocket's comp is going to scale a little bit more. You know, we're looking at these items, looking at the slower laning phase. You touched on the fact Tiamat has been picked up by Wicked. We see the makings of what appears to be a Bilgewater Cutlass for Zazis. When we've seen Blade of the Rune Kings been picked up on Trundle. Oh, they've caught out Selva. They're going straight in towards him, but Selva immediately, like you mentioned, Vanda, that black shield so, so fast on towards him. Very quick reactions. And it's kind of what we've come to expect from Vanda. Really one of the highlights, one of the top support players that has joined the league this season. Yeah, one of the things that Alliance need to be careful of, Selva's working with the BF Sword to the Vamp Scepter of Tabs. So just in terms of raw auto attack damage, the advantage is definitely in favor of Selva. He throws down the ace in the hole once again just to try to get some lane control. They dive on Vanda. Going back on towards him, Nif just trying to cause himself a problem there. Is that shield of Daybreak like you mentioned on Vanda? Do manage to get the stun out on this time. And instead, son of a trading with tabs. The aggression's starting to come out here from Alliance. This is Nif hitting level 7. Notice now how Sullivan and Vanda are playing this lane. They're a lot more defensive. They're sitting at their tower because they actually can't afford to get caught out. If Nif gets a good uh, chain of CC down and the culling catches on Sullivan, he will die. Culling being physical damage, Black Shield's not going to block it, and Vanda's not going to offer a whole lot in the way of you know uh, preventing the burst from killing his AD carry. He's also lacking boots, which is why he's about to back off and bite. The speed was with Alliance. Warding on towards the Dragon here. This could be a start off for Alliance. They may be maneuvering for position here. They spotted Selva going back. Now we'll see how quickly they can take this one down with the help of Elise and his Spidelings. It could be very efficient. Froggen 
most likely going to throw down that glacial storm, but that's a very good call from Alliance. They knew the teleports had been used, and Zazas had used it in the top lane. They knew that the Rocket's bottom lane was backing, and that was just a great, decisive in-game leadership call. Fast calls, and that's something that worked out very well for Alliance last week. However, it has been hit and miss between the two. Yankos going for the early, uh, the little invade there, getting that ward down. So he's getting coverage of that top lane. That's maybe going to start signaling a gank on this top lane. Well, we'll see what Jankos can do. Wicked has gone in, does have his flash and dominus. Here comes Jankos from the side. Look for the Sonic Wave. Is he going to go towards it? No. Wicked dodging that one pretty quickly with the slice. Yeah, so we, we looked at the Sonic Wave. It was pretty, but it didn't connect. <laughs> so unfortunately, Jankos needs to back away. He didn't have a ward to throw down either, so that sort of insect maneuver of jumping in front of a target and kicking back didn't happen. That's the first attempt I feel we've actually seen in lane from either Jankos and Shook. And I think in that regard, Shook's doing very well. He hasn't given anything up. He hasn't necessarily helped gain anything, but Elise is going to do much better. They've caught Saliva. Going Solar Flare straight on towards Saliva. They do get the lock up. There's going to be Shield to Daybreak. He's going to be caught very low, but it's not enough damage to follow through there. Tabs just wasn't close enough. And very importantly, Vander actually threw that Dark Binding past Nif to try catch Tabs out. I think if Tabs had been one or two steps further, it may actually have caught him out. Nevertheless, Seliva gets out a little uh, safely, but that was way too close. He shouldn't have been overextended without his support nearby. And I think good play by Nef to try it, make something happen, but it just didn't pay off that time. We'll see how much damage Alliance can put down towards this tower at the moment. They are focusing, going towards the red buff, so potentially going to not bother pushing that tower. They're happy to keep the lane out, and they're actually making a maneuver for, for the middle lane. They're going to try and go for overpower. Yeah, there's a lot of members of Alliance starting to group up here on the lane. I think they feel like they can just group force their way in. It's working out. Tabs with that B of Sword and the help of Shook. They're on the turret. Jankos is going to reply, but he's a little late. Yeah, the Cocoon not landing on Overpower. I think that would have been a signal for Alliance to dive on him, but instead they don't manage to get him. They just all step away from that one. They got a good chunk of damage. Wicked caught out in between the turrets here. Trying to get aggressive, trying to farm between the lanes, but it's not really working out for him. No, not this time round. And I, I think what Alliance were doing there was very smart because Tabs and Nif had shoved the wave into Rocket's tower. So by forcing Sullivan and Vanda to actually react to defend that mid lane, which they did, they lost some CS. They lost some of their own, some of their opponent's creeps. They lost gold. They lost experience. And now Tabs and Nif are going to be returning to this lane once they uh, group up and they're going to continue pushing it down. So I think that was, once again, very good decision making. They didn't get the tower, but they got a lot of damage done. And if they rinse and repeat again in the next couple of minutes, they should be able to secure the tower. This time around, Shook sneaking in towards the top there. Dominus is about to wear off from Wicked, so maybe going to try and bait this one out here, but I think Zazus may well smell it, realizing why is Wicked going so aggressive on me? He is starting to try and turn it away and just waiting for a good, clean cocoon to be fired off from Shook, but it doesn't seem it's going to happen. So Zazus doesn't have a lot of mana. He doesn't have Subjugate available either. Now, Cocoon's going to connect. He does manage to land. He goes in, sinks the fangs down. Zazus quickly pops that ultimate down and backs away. Yeah, Zazus forced to flash instantly. Not his ultimate. N not his ultimate, just the uh, Frozen <laughs> Domain. Get the additional movement speed. But I think it was the smart decision. If the Renekton stun had landed, with uh, Wicked having his um, Ignite available, there was kill potential and kill threat there. We do see Yankos now trying to do the same, but a ward spotted him out, which means now I'm just going to rotate back down. Blue buff should be up, but it's about 30 seconds, 40 seconds away. I feel it's why they're going for the white. We did see Overpower. He's also taken the Wolves as well, so a lot of farm being stolen away from Yankos. Two teleports have been used now by Zazus, both return to lane, and with Zazus having the Chain Vest and the Blade of the Rune King, I think his kill potential is going to be higher on Wicked. Wicked's got the makings of a Sunfire Cape, but that's not going to defend against the magic damage of that Blade of the Ruined King, which allows you to chunk down percentage HP. So in this lane setup, now that we've hit a level 11, both of these laners hitting around 150 CS, Zazus has done a great job of <laughs> just interrupting over time. Zazus has done a great job of surviving the lane phase, and now I actually think he's powerful enough to win fights and trades with him. Not the moment, though. Glacial Storm just being used consistently to farm out overpower. Very much reading the situation. Nif had tried to sneak up that river and try and get a catch on him, but there was a ward placed in that bush which gave him away. Wicked and Zazas in his top lane, just back and forth, head to head. Blade the Rune King completed by Zazas. Now Wicked, of course, had that team out a long time ago. Almost got the Sunfire Cape completed as well. Well, we'll see what Alliance decides to do. They're once again grouping up in this middle lane. We do see that Seliva is heavily pushing that bottom lane, taking that side lane farm. And this should result in the fact if they stick around. But Alliance playing it very, very safe. They don't want to get caught out by a potential engage by either Shook or Vanda. They, they had no idea where Shook was at that instance. Well, that was the second time they've chosen. Ooh, 
Frogan ready and waiting in this bush. This time around, they could go for it. This is going to have the help. Oh, Jankos, he's coming up there. Are they going to have enough damage on towards Azus? They're going to take him low. Hasn't got that ultimate, and he just easy, easy kill. First blood for Frogan on Anivia. Landed absolutely every ability. I actually think Wicked played that one perfectly. He waited for the Subjugate to come down from Zazus. Most likely called out that their Pillar of Ice had been used. And just such a great flash for us. Frogan throws out the Q, predicts where Zazus is going, and easily grabs not only the kill, but the first time of the game here in favor of Alliance. And that was a long time coming. You saw the averages popping up there in the six to seven minute frame. That was 17 minutes before first blood. What are they going to do with it? Both teams have farmed up heavily. The fact that they're just leading, leaving the lane phase is now at 150 plus CS. This is going to be a slow one. Maybe it's going to transition very quickly, though. I think it's going to be very explosive once they start fighting around dragons. You see, Overpower is already dueling Nif, gets two or three auto attacks down and makes him lose 50% of his HP. Had a Dark Binding connected or the Sonic Wave, that could have been a kill which could result in the tower. So the potential for explosive action is very high now that all of these champions have hit a nice power threshold. Everybody's starting to hit level 10 to 12. Starting to come into there. Froggen back in that mid lane. Hasn't got blue buff available this time around, so that mana will be churning down. And as you can see, he's building ready for it. Has switched over, though. He was going towards that theme. Or maybe just picked up the challenge for that extra mana. Who knows? He has gone for that needlessly large rod after getting that kill in the top. Alliance are now trying to secure this blue buff. Look at how many members Alliance need to pull back. They realize Rocket wants to challenge. The stun connect! Stun catches on towards it. Vanda and Jankos both caught out there. Solar Flare comes in. The Kulin not really catching too heavily on Jankos. The Ignite was burning on him. Salabar using that 90 caliber net and the ace in the hole on Frogan, and that's just going to keep Alliance at bay. Such an important pillar of ice there from Zazas, preventing the rest of Alliance from chasing. Now Rocket are trying to back away and heal. They've lost so much HP in Alliance, it looks like they've caught Overpower. Frogan's turned into an egg, he's going to get Overpower down though, Zazas in trouble, he's going to get dropped down here, Wicked will one more cleave, they're going to try and gift it across, it's Shook that will take it. Alliance get two kills out of that one. Overpower stuck around when I don't think he should have. Jankos was too low to fight, as was Vanda, and they were recalling. They were backing away. Alliance responded well. Peeled away from the dragon, got themselves some kills, and now they should be able to secure this dragon. And it's a super not this time. Yeah, I tried to get that pilt over Peacemaker. Steel not going to work out. Middle turret also going down. That's a big chunk of objectives being picked up by Alliance there. A lot of kills all going their way, as well as that dragon and that tower. And of course, Wicked has managed to get back into that top lane, so they don't even have that top tower trade for the dragon. No, not at all. And Alliance have just strung together. That's their second dragon of the game. They got themselves a tower, and they got themselves a couple of kills. And if you look where the kills are situated, it is on Shook's Elise, Froggen's Anivia, and Tab's as Lucian, which is the, the carries you really want. Elise is going to scale so well with some kills and some gold. Got the makings of that haunting guys being completed as well. And I think Alliance just played that very well. They grouped around blue, realized that Rocket may want to go blue or dragon, didn't let them do it, and then picked the fight which they won. And it's interesting to see how this top lane continues to go. Zazas versus Wicked, because you remember, Zazas chose to go for Trundle. He had Renekton available to him, went for Trundle. So at the moment, not really working out too well from him. Has had two deaths, been dived on that tower, of course, in the top and down at the dragon. So I think it... it it was a calculated decision in that Trundle is going to become more and more relevant, more and more pertinent as this game goes on. And see now Nip a little bit in trouble. Here comes Overpower as well. He just managed to pop his shield. He is going to get kicked back into Overpower. Now he's in trouble. Solar Flare going down. Flashes away from it. Jankos follows through nicely. Is he going to get covered off in time? He gets stunned out there. If safe, Jankos has to get away. Intervention used by Overpower. Dark Binding catches on towards Tabs, but nothing will follow. Very good re reply there from Alliance. Frogan once again showing his mastery of Anivia, landing that Flash Frost from through the wall. That stunned Jankos up, saved Nif's life, and he manages to get away. They trade a couple of summoner spells, but as uh, again, we're seeing Alliance being at the right place at the right time and responding as a team, which I think is very crucial to highlight. And this is interesting because we really haven't seen Anivia for a very long time in League of Legends, let alone 2014 season, up against the Kale, and it seems to be working well. Kale is not going to get start farming, it seems. Obviously, Froggen's going to be doing the same. You can see both giant numbers, 200 CS already, 21 minima. I'm going to go, now that I've been thinking about the matchup and seeing how this is playing out, I'm going to actually call Anivia somewhat of a soft counter to Kale. And my reasoning for this is fairly simple. Kale needs to be in range to auto attack you. Yes, she has some ranged abilities. Anivia can throw down the Glacial Storm or Ultimate and back away. Kale needs to either go through that, which slows you down, or go around it, which means not in range, not going to be able to attack you. And if you are in, a, in great threat, you can just use your crystallized wall, put it down, 
Kael, when she's coming at you, comes in a very linear direction, which makes it easier to land your Q for Anivia and get the stun. So I think it's smart play from Froggen to make that work. Shook making his way down towards his bottom lane. We'll see whether he goes for anything here. Actually, they're going to try and go aggressive for Nif. That may well have backfired on Rocket, actually, there. I don't know whether Nip was going to try and set that one up. He's going to pop that ward down. They catch a glimpse of it. And suddenly, Rocket realized the dangerous situation they are in. Four members of Alliance now in this bottom lane. Alliance are making it clear they want towers. And now they want Selva. They're going to get on towards him. And they haven't quite got enough damage. And now Shook's tanking out that turret. Does repel away. He's going to drop back straight back into the same situation. Wicked comes around the backside of them onto Vanda. The they chose in towards it. Vanda pops his ultimate and Wiki just shrugs it off and walks away. Dark Binding catches, but now Vanda caught out by that wall. Culling coming through, not quite catching the back of them. An alliance while well, they take the tower down, but no one goes with it. Yeah, but that Dragon's Rage kick was used there by Jankos just defensively against the Lions. They secured themselves a the tower. They've got an HP and an ultimate advantage now, so they're going to start sieging. Froggen's caught out to the rest of the Lions are on the tower. Going aggressive on Wicked as well on the tower. Jankos takes a big burst of damage there. Salava trying to catch on towards it. Tab second very low, but they just don't have enough. Sazas comes around the backside. Finally, they're going to turn this one around. Rockout on towards Nip. Nip in all sorts of trouble. He's going to get locked down. That's another kill for Rockout. They're going to keep on chasing. Vander, if he lands his Dark Bindings, almost certainly will be another death for him. He's going to throw it out. No, tries to throw it blind. He doesn't catch it out. Frogan turns it around, pops out of a where he stands, and now Zaz is in trouble. The cocoon flashed away at the last second. Great pillar of ice, and that will be Rockout back in a way. Both teams making similar sort of mistakes. Alliance had vision in and around the red buff, but they didn't react to Zazus until it was too late. As Alliance were backing away, Tabs was too far forward, got caught up by too much poke from Rocket and damage, which allowed Zazus to kill him. And then Rocket, as you mentioned, feeling that if a Dark Binding were to connect, they could get a kill. Take a look at this. Teleport actually comes in from behind. That is why Alliance didn't react till it was too late. Zaz is completely cutting them off. Tabs just too far forward, and I believe that was a subjugate landing loss ticker damage, actually. A great intervention from Rocket, but that was the power of that teleport. It's the third time we've seen it being used by Zaz. He comes in from behind the whole Alliance team, and that was why Alliance didn't react in time. I think they may have even forgotten if it was there or could be used. So, where does this take us? It's a 3,000 gold differential currently with Alliance in the lead. They have that extra tower taken down as we approach the 25 minute mark. Dragon will be up in 50 seconds and they're starting to ward out Baron. I want to point out something. Not only has Froggen picked a Nivea for the first time in the 2014 season, he's grabbed himself a Scrying Orb as well. He's going to be able to have that ability to scan out either buffs or objectives. And I love this item pickup, especially for teams that are playing heavy invades and playing heavily aggressive. It prevents you doing a blind face check. So we'll see how it works out for him. He has yet to use that ability as it's still winding up. And we'll see how it works for Alliance and for Frog. Well, that Guardian Angel also picked up as the third item for Wicked, the first one of the game so far. Lich Bane was completed by Overpower a while ago. Nash's Tooth, of course, that was his first item completed. So starting to build up that power now on Overpower. They are just collapsing on towards that dragon. Now, one thing I do want to talk about as the dragon's being started, both of these teams have done phenomenal with wards this entire game. The minimap has been littered. Alliance, they've decided they want dragon. Rocket have decided they can siege down the tower. I think mostly I prefer the trade for Rocket as they secure the lost outer turret and it gives them a way into Alliance's jungle. But Alliance complete dragon control, three for three. It's a trade that both seemed happy with. Nobody really wanted to defend off the other, but Alliance are going to try and shove straight down this mid lane now. They've caught Rocket a little bit out of position here. A little bit. This is very out of position. Rocket are not going to be able to respond. If Vanda comes in from behind, Soul Shackles is available. Look at that. The Dragon's Rage kick was just used to interrupt the lines, but it's not going to matter. He used it on Wicked. He just, everybody else parted the waves, shrugged him off in a turret down. That is a good trade for Alliance. Alliance have got themselves a nice gold lead. And I think with Wicked going for Guardian Angel and the power of Anivia in these team fights, this is going to be scary. Solar Flare catching out Vander and Sullivan. That means the Zazas and Yankos have actually been separated. Remember that Dragon Rage kick was already used by Yankos, but he's going to follow it through. Tries to go in there. Great Pillar of Ice locking up Wicked and Shook here. Wicked and Shook just taking all of the damage now. That's going to be Vander popping his ultimate off there, but that's a Guardian Angel on Wicked. He's just going to come back to life. Shook chasing away as well. Rocket really just forcing off Alliance. They do catch a Dark Binding on towards Wicked, but not much else. Two things. Froggen was untouched and had a full mana bar. Jankos had jumped into the middle of that fight and because he didn't have his Dragon Rage available, had no option to kick a member of Alliance towards his team. You highlighted how important that Pillar of Ice was. It locked up Alliance in that area. But again, 
the zone control and the damage that Nivea offers prevented the rest of Rocket from getting in. You've got a melee trundle, melee Lee Sin that has to get through all of Anivia's slow, all of Anivia's walls, and it just simply wasn't uh, capable there for Rocket. They couldn't pull it off. They did get that Guardian Angel down. It will have a fairly long timer, but honestly, 27 minutes in, I don't think that's too much of a problem. Oh, Overpower choosing to go the opposite direction, and then he got caught out by that stun and takes a burst of damage from Frog and realizing just how much he can trade back and forth right now. And I think that is a perfect... Uh, example of why I feel that this Anivia is a great soft counter, counter to, to Kale. Just gives <laughs> you so much zone control. I, I, I don't know if I want to call it a hard counter, but the way Froggen's playing it, Overpower's had zero impact against him. He hasn't been able to 1v1 him, hasn't been able to find kills. And as long as Froggen is keeping Overpower away from his team and his team fights, it's going to give Tabs and Shook and Wicked some more time to position and play the fight as they want to. No surprise, Vanda keeps on landing those dark bindings. The amount of death sentence he used to lands on Thresh, it's not a surprise he can land the skill shot once again. Although, sadly, not a lot of follow up on it so far. Of course, he's not flinging himself in there this time around. Let's see how he builds that because at the moment he has completed that talisman now without boots and mobility. We'll see where he goes from here with that. Yeah, he's got the Kindle Gem as well, so additional CDR on HP. And I, I love the way. You know, Vanda's not afraid to play these slightly different support champions, but I want to see how he itemizes. In terms of the rest of the lanes, you have Randy and Zoman, as well as that haunting guy, is already completed from Shook. In comparison, Vankos is only working with that Locket of the Iron Story, so he's quite a bit behind in terms of raw uh, survivability, as well as tankiness. However, if he gets a good Locket off, that can help against the burst that Froggen's putting down, but ideally Rocket don't want to be grouped up against that AoE damage. Tabs could be in trouble. He's in a lot of trouble here. It's going to be overpowered coming around. Not a lot of Tabs can do about it. He can't flash away. He's going to turn the call in. But in comes Nip. In comes Shook. In comes Froggen. Everybody piling on to Yankos and he gets dropped. Now Overpower's going to be chasing there. Shook, can he land the cocoon? Will he spit out that poison? Froggen caught with a brilliant dark bind in the game from Brian there. And that's just in the tower range. Now we do see Zazus has been split pushing himself. He's pushed the wave all the way up to the top. They've died. They've died not towards Overpower, but again, that Dark Shield rune jobs doing his work, and Vanda does manage to keep them at bay. The stun comes out. Oh, Vanda just sidestepping in. That is the inner turret in the top lane going down, though. Uh, the bottom lane, sorry, but this now the inhibitor turret. What are you going to do, Zazus? He's teleporting in, but it's too late. Yeah, there's nothing they can do. Tower drops, and Zazus and Overpower trying to find something to do on the way out, but they can't catch members of Alliance. That was a very good combo. Zazus and Vanda, they're going to carry on chasing. The stun squad, Vanda. He's going to throw the dark body out, but again, there's no follow. Up. This time Overpower coming around the side, but he doesn't want to 5v1 this one. He does throw out the Q, lands it on towards Nif. Dark finally goes up to Nif as well. Nif taking everything here, but his team just step up, cover him off. Intervention on Overpower, just about saving his skin. Vanda gonna follow through. Dark Bindy will be back up in a moment, but he hasn't got the range anymore. And it's gonna be Alliance that will back away. Pillar of Ice is available in just a moment, but again, great crowd control. Shoot. Doing the job. Yeah, the crystallizer is going to throw them up, but look at the side. Overpower's going to be flanking. Overpower chased down. Now Alliance are in trouble. This could be carnage. This could be an ace. And there's going to be Alliance in trouble. They're caught out in the bush. Look at the side here. That's going to be Niv locking him down. It is going to be one kill for Taps. Can he get a second of Vanda? Yes, he can. It will be the death of him. Oh, will it? He's on towards him. But Yankos, Yankos locks on towards him. Frogger doing what he can to keep him at bay. I don't believe the wall comes in. But Selva finally finishes it off. Frogger with no mana. He's just running for his life now. Can Yanko stop him down? Can they close him in? He does get to the tower safety. So they end up trading four for two in that extremely extended fight. Rocket lose two towers in that top lane, but are able to push Alliance backwards, fight all the way through that crowd control. You have to give props to Tabs. In that situation, he focused Overpower, got him down, knowing that the intervention wasn't available. Now a three-man Rocket are gonna try tank up his Baron and drop it. Frogan's gonna should be able to get in range. Maybe, maybe, but I think uh, Rocket can get this one. They've got Smite available. Frog and his head is straight for it. There is a ward spotting him off at the side there. They've got to be ready and waiting for it. But with that smite available, you would assume that Lee Sin can lock it up. He will take it out there. Stun though straight away. Not going to be enough from Frog. So Baron secured for Rocket. They now have a small edge in terms of the fighting. They've got statistical advantage. They've got the regen advantage. And that may help them out against those prolonged fights. During the course of that massive run from the inhibitor to the top lane, all of the members of Rocket ran out of energy, ran out of mana, and were running low on HP. If you rinse and repeat that, it's going to give them a massive advantage. Dragon has been stopped by lines. I don't know if Rocket can challenge it very far away for us. We've got three members close enough. It's only going to be a dark binding. 
landed on Niff, and that will not follow through. Overpal sensing out Tabs there, but Tabs already backing off. So, that is all for Dragon so far for Alliance, but of course, as you mentioned, that Baron going to rock out. Let's see what they do with it. I think Rocket need to find a way to once again flank Alliance. You've seen how impactful it was in that previous fight. Overpower came in from the, the, the forest, the bush on his side, cutting into the lane and splitting Alliance up. He managed to cut across the blue buff area through the river, once again coming in behind the members of Alliance. And when Zazus or Overpower can do that, split them up, get a lot of damage down, Alliance don't have a response. If you cast your minds back to the bottom lane fight, Zazus teleport behind them and created such a, a, a ruckus that Alliance couldn't respond. That has to be the way Rocket pull themselves back by winning a team fight and then getting objectives. Well, let's, let's talk about both these AD carries because they've got very similar builds. Of course, I'd say that was Trinity Force, Bloodthirster and Last Whisper. Meanwhile, Static Shiv, Last Whisper and Last, uh, Bloodthirster for Celeva. Who is going to be the more strong, stronger? Who is going to be stronger? <laughs> it's the word I'm after. I Come the end think, of the game. I, I actually think the, the longer the game goes, the more impact I feel that Celeva's Caitlyn will, will have because of her long range and the fact that she's a little bit safer than Tabs. However, Tabs is going to be a little bit better in those 1v1 one -one situations. His kit and the range in his culling makes him very, very useful while he's backing out of a fight, while he's trying to siege down. These are actually very standard builds. And with Celebin now grabbing himself that Banshee's Veil, whereas Tabs is going to the Glass Cannon with another BF Sword, the survivability that Celebin has now gained himself, he's going to avoid one of the stuns, avoid a cocoon, you know. He's not going to be instantly popped once Leona gets his Zenith Blade because he's going to have that shield to block one of those CCs. Let's we'll see what develops in this one at the moment. Wicked and Tabs in his top lane. We do see Zazas there, but he's already stepping away. As it is, Rocket haven't chosen to group up yet, even despite having this Baron buff for the last two minutes. I think Rocket are, well, first of all, they're playing from behind. They have to make up the gold difference, and you can do that by farming. In addition, they're scared of the 5v5 power of Alliance. No stun connects or no fights. I also want to highlight the fact that the Zeke's Herald has been picked up by Vanda. He's going to give some uh, additional lifesteal to the heavy auto-attack team of Kale, Beeson, and Trundle. So, once again, smart itemization, making his uh, overall team fine presence felt even more by giving his team that aura. We see overpower down this bottom lane, ready and waiting. Of course, remember they did take down that inner turret in the bottom lane. Zazas did that solo, while the rest of Rockout were defending that top lane of their own, and they are starting to push on towards this inhibitor turret. Maybe going to buy them time to that top inner. So Rocket is split pushing right now. They've got a 1-3-1 one, one push in the top, mid, and bottom lanes. And because of the mobility of Kale having that additional speed push she can throw in herself, and the fact that Zazas can teleport in, I'm expecting them to look for an opportunity, look for a fight, and then rely on Zazas or Overpower to join the fight from the side to do that flanking maneuver we talked about. Look at how Overpower is now roaming into this mid lane and Zazas is being held off by Wicked. If they were to start a fight, a teleport from Zazas would give Rocket the advantage if it were immediately to happen. Oh, Wicked is not doing too well in the trade so far. He's already lost half his, half his hit points as they keep going back and forward. That's why Tabs is going to go up there. Now they're going to try and trade on towards him. They're going in towards Zazas. Can they get him picked down? They're going to try and force the pressure. But while this is all happening, of course, the middle lane is now under pressure because that's where Rocket are going as well as that bottom lane. Yeah, the rest of Rocket need to respond to this. You can see Overpower moving to the mid lane. Dominus is not available from Wicked, so they get a lot of damage on that tower. But the moment that Wicked gets into vision from that red buff, Rocket back away. So this is a safe, smart siege. Keep in mind that their Baron buff has just worn out. So there's, that additional regen is no longer there. And there is still, you know, 3,000 gold done. I think, realistically, it's evened out. Wicked cannot stop that push from Zazas in the top lane. He's losing health. As you mentioned, he's already used Dominus to try and stay alive up there. Meanwhile, we see Yankos again tanking out that turret, buying time for Celeva to keep on him. And so smart. He's standing right on top of that Yordle snap trap. So if anybody tries to commit to him, they will be locked up in CC, which will allow the rest of the team to react. Even though Jankos is caught, nobody from Alliance wants to commit. Froggen was not there, nor is Wicked. This is a very good position for Rocket to start split pushing, controlling the map, and then when the fight happens, allow Zazus or Overpower to join from the side. However, I would argue that Alliance have done a very good job at handing and st at stalling out the Baron. The Baron buff was on Rocket. They went for that 1-3-1 one, one split. They haven't taken any objectives yet. They are close to taking this military. They're close to taking that top turret. But as they've yet, 
they are holding ground. Yeah, I completely agree. The question is how do they turn it around? Alliance needs to grab either an all-in with a Leona Solar Flare or allow Shook and Frog to try and find a pick. Now, get a stun down, try to pop somebody, and then uh, repel Rocket. As it stands, Rocket are happy to continue sieging. They've got a lot of sustain. With that Zeke's Herald, as long as there's minions and monsters to auto-attack, they're going to be giving themselves lifesteal. And look at this. They've stolen the blue buff away from Alliance completely uncontested. Yeah, and that's a big deal for Frog and on Nivea. He kind of needs that blue buff. Very mana hungry, so we're going to hold those extended sieges, but they have held off. Baron will be up in a minute, Dragon up in 40 seconds, Wicked, well, did just about enough to keep Zalus away from this top turret, and now, again, regenerating that hit points on Alliance. They're pushing out the wave very quickly. Alliance have to. Because of the fact that their, their wave clear is very dependent on having Froggen alive at the tower, you know, he can defend well. Uh, Tabs and Shook do a good job against the three members of Rock Out, but we didn't see sort of an all-in fight. And, we highlighted how impactful the, the uh, Nivea pickup can be of stalling the game, getting into late, defending those towers. If anybody knows how to stall games and get into late on a Nivea, Froggen is the man. He's written the book on how to get to the 40, 50 minute matches. And that's where we find ourselves now. Yeah, it is going to be barren vision that they're going to start fighting for. You can see Sullivan back in his mid lane with that static chip doing work. Banshee's Leon now picked up as well. So we're going to make sure he keeps those waves cleared and doesn't get caught out by Shoot, who is trying to sneak around that side. So we do see that Froggen is still sitting with that scrying orb trinket. Um, if I'm brutally honest, we haven't seen a super clear-cut case of it being more beneficial than having, say, a sneaking ring or a ward himself, but they've been defending, they've been sitting on the back line waiting for that Baron to wear off, so it hasn't been needed. Now that Alliance is starting to roam around the map, we'll see how it gets used. It is available for Froggen to cast. Dragon is up, Baron is up. There are targets there it would be appropriate to use. Yeah, I was wondering whether Zazus was contemplating maybe soloing that dragon down. He certainly could do, but instead chooses to make sure he's topped off with light. You see Overpower once again heading off towards that bottom lane. Ace in a hole used on Wicked really doesn't dent him too heavily. But there you go, really have an answer to the split push here, because every time they see Overpower going off to the side, who is now taking that dragon down, by the way, this dragon's going to be worth a lot of gold. Yeah, definitely. We're hitting the point in the game, I think all the champions are at max levels, around 13 euro gold for your team. But the one thing I do want to highlight while that dragon's going on, look at the, the number of wards littered across the mini-map right now. Alliance and Rocket are having an immense amount of vision control. Rocket had way more wards in the Baron Pit than Alliance did, and that's why Alliance was trying to move in there, try to get themselves some control with those sweeping lenses. Well, Randa's going to get stunned. This could be a fight. There's a big minion wave in the bottom. Dark Binding flashes past it. Shook this actually caught out. There's going to be Overpower laying the damage down on him. Has to repel away from this one. He's going to go across to those raids. While this is all happening, there is a big wave of minions on the bottom lane on Alliance's base, and Rocket got complete positional advantage to take this in. Yeah, there's nothing Alliance can do right now. They've even caught Nip out in the background, so they get themselves one tower. Now the fact that Nip needs to recall and push away, this is going to be a 5v4 if Alliance want to start the fight. Overpass moving to the bottom lane. He's going to try to take that tower. Frog is there to defend. He's just going to get caught out and again. That was a bit of damage. Sullivan taking every chance he can to shoot the towers, which is I absolutely love because so often you see the AD carries not putting themselves in a tiniest position to get a hit on the tower instead. Alliance do push them out, but they lost that one in a turret as well as the dragon. Now, something that we haven't necessarily touched on yet, which I think is important to note, with the combination of Trundle and Kale, when they get on a, onto a target, they shred the defensive statistics. We do see Alliance. They realize they're in a powerful position. They want to start this Baron off. There's not enough members of Rocket to defend, and they've caught Zazus. They're going onto Zazus. Zazus flashes away from that one. They're keeping on that Baron. Now they're going to try and peel, but Tab's taken low already. Look at the damage coming out from Zazus. Overpower joins the party and just cleaves him down. Now they're going on towards Nip. Nip getting dropped like a sack of spuds. Shoot goes down as well. And now Ace in the hole will finish the job on Nip. Now they're going on towards Wicked, Wicked's running away with that Dominus, but that's three easy kills in the Baron pit. This is now five versus three. Rocket have set their sights on the inhibitor turret. There's nothing that Alliance can do. Froggen is going to have to pull off a godlike defense with this. And Nivea, he's not even in range to make this happen. And Rocket will grab themselves the inhibitor turret and the inhibitor if they want. They may even take the game here. They can push on through to the Nexus. 30 minutes still on those death timers in a 2v5 situation. You do have to take the inhibitor down. I think they're going to play it safe. And maybe, no, they're going to go for it. They're going for the Nexus. You can see Froggen do what he can to keep them at bay here. Wicked alongside him, the two games haven't got enough. He gets egged in seconds, and that's going to be Froggen going down. This will be Rockat surely taking the game. They're pushing on towards the Nexus turrets, driving it down. Wicked just getting chunked down there. Overpower just cleaving his way. Nothing he could do. Guardian Angels doesn't survive, and he just pops up and dies instantly. Rockat will once again take the game over Alliance.
I cannot understand the decision making from Alliance. They tried to rush down that Baron. The team of Rocket were able to respond quickly enough. And you've seen how much damage they put down onto Tev before the fight began. Overpower comes in from the side, just swings his Righteous Fury once and dropped it. The, the team fight was over truly before it even began. Fantastic stuff from Rocket. And as you mentioned, you know, so methodically played by Alliance. You've got to remember, they were the ones that were putting pressure on the inhibitor to, to begin with in that top lane. They were chased out. Rockout then took the Baron, took the advantage, and just swung the game in their favor. Yeah, they really did. And from the get-go of this matchup, you can feel both teams were comfortable going late. We didn't see Jankos or Shook making any forms of uh, early ganks or any kind of lane control. It really felt like they wanted to get to the late game, wanted to get to the roaming. And in general, Alliance played it very well. Their mid-game rotations were good. They had complete dragon control. But one bad decision at 45 minutes costs you a game. You cannot afford to have those bad calls the later the game goes. And something we should really pay attention to now, ladies and gentlemen, is because Rocket are now number one in the European LCS. They are top of the league. Fnatic, of course, losing. They're now seven and four. They're eight and three in the league. It's fantastic. I think they deserve the position. The games that they have lost, they have been outplayed, and I think they've been very open about their mistakes as well. But in general, they're showing the depth and ability in every single area of the league. Their picks and bands are great, their gameplay is great, their strategy seems sound, and in this matchup, they were down five, 6,000 gold at some point. You never felt like the game was over. You never felt like, hey, Rocket are now finished, and they pulled it back late. And it seems that when you leave KL open for overpower, no matter what you do, he is going to be a menace come late game, and absolutely destroyed him again. Vanda on the screen there, fantastic game once again from Morgana this time around. He's uh, Vanda Life, as he's starting to be called, nicknamed, because he's been landing those skill shots to great uh, Vale, and they really have worked out well for him. And, you know, even with the Thresh, they banned out that Thresh, took it away from him, but again, pulled out another champion, pulled out another victory. Yeah, two for two. So he's played Morgana twice, and it, it seems as though when the opposing team has got very strong initiation, and wants to jump at you, that seems to be his default. That seems to be his, okay, well, if we're expecting our opponents like a Renekton and Elise Lisa Leona to dive in, grab Soul Shackles. Like, what are you going to do when you jump in at me and the longer you stay here, the more likely you are to get stunned and killed by the Trundle and the uh, Kale. Well, fantastic game from Rockout. We are going to go out.